Okay. Namaste and Julie. Okay. Ladies, ladies and ladies, no gentlemen. So <laughs> wonderful, wonderful uh, seeing all of you and talking to you. I'm not sure my voice is audible, is it? It's perfectly fine. Yeah, it, yeah? it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Please uh, do let me if uh, any break of voice uh, or problems happen because I wouldn't know. But uh, thank you. Thank you for being here and uh, empowering yourselves and contributing to the society in your own ways. And I've been trying to do that up in these mountains uh, in my own ways. You're still with me? You can hear me? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, because Ladakhi uh, networks sometimes can be challenging like the rest of uh, climate and other challenges. So <clears throat> I'll share a little bit of my journey, my story about <clears throat> sustainable education, helping young people choose sustainable careers or a sustainable economy, and finally, sustainable world or planet. So um, I was born in a region of this planet, uh, which is a great test of sustainability. You know, you cannot survive in a region like Ladakh without being very, very uh, innovative, very, very uh, caring and sensitive and sensible to all the resources that you have. Very, very little uh, nature gives us. We are very high up, high and dry. Nature has quite left us actually uh, up in the mountain deserts. Yet people have lived quite happily in these mountains for millennia. And that's something to learn from. And that's something I grew up seeing. And that was part of my education. Uh, um, unlike many of uh, you or children today, I was born in a very tiny village, so I didn't have schools and I learned more from the environment, from the people around me, from animals and nature and you know, mountains and rivers. Um, so I grew up believing that uh, you do not not learn if you don't have schools. What is really most important ingredient of education is your own curiosity. As long as you have curiosity in you and there are people who support and nurture that curiosity, you learn with or without schools. Nature packs uh, this software. I consider this as a beautiful software that all babies who are the hardware come with, you know, wired to unfold the rest of the world with this curiosity. So I was able to learn things uh, without textbooks or schools, thanks to a supportive environment and a lot of curiosity on a tiny village farm with just five households. Yeah? And that's where I uh, grew up till about nine years of age, after which I was dragged into schools. And actually, I often say that's where my true learning ended, because schools being schools are full of rituals that you do with or without purpose and make children, you know, stand on the back bench if they are not uh, very clever or they do not look, I was unfortunately one of them. I didn't speak any Hindi or English when I was taken to a school from Ladakh uh, and they didn't speak my language. I didn't speak their language. They thought I was mentally retarded and they would put me on the back benches and um, I would wonder how my teacher thinks that I would learn if I'm weak, I would learn more on the back benches than in the front bench or in her lap, which is where I would put somebody ne who needs help. So, but the system was such that I was, I spent more time maybe outside the classroom door um, than 
inside because I wouldn't do homework and I would be judged as a very bad student. But uh, all said and done today, I still get to say I was an outstanding student huh? <clears throat> because I spent such time outside the door. Um, um, I had a great uh, feeling for why the schools were like that, why children like me were made to feel so small and so uh, low about myself. These helped me later to chart out a way of helping other students from facing the same uh, problems. So I, like all children, um, had this uh, capacity to quickly catch up. Uh, so I did finally catch up with others and did quite well in school when I met the right kinds of teachers and right kind of support. Uh, when I changed a school, but I won't go into details today of that. Mm, suffice it to say that I, uh, with the help of right uh, caring hands, I could catch up and more than um, do well. And finally, I finished my engineering, mechanical engineering. And during that, um, when I was helping students, I saw the state of the education system. Uh, when I had to teach students to actually support my own engineering, that's when I came face to face with the education system, how it was so insensitive to how children are. And that's when I started working in the field of education rather than continuing as another engineer in the long queues for jobs outside, uh, you know, employers. I decided I was more needed by the students uh, and that way I could uh, liberate a lot of suffering souls like myself uh, had been. So I'll start my thing from that part. It's a long story of how I got into education, but uh, I'll to, for today's topic, I'll start with this school finally that I set up for those students who were failing in the system, just like I was. Uh, I had all the memories, and the empathy to do something for them. Um, in Ladakh of those days, actually 95% of the students were failing every year in their 10th grade. I mean, it's unimaginable that 95% of any products in any system fail uh, and you blame the products. That's what was happening in Ladakh. The children would be blamed for being retarded, for being, you know, bad students. And I thought, no, the system needs to be looked into when there's such um, rampant failure. So there was a point when I saw that even after the reforms we brought in schools, uh, there were students who would still fail when the results went higher and it was no longer 5% success. It went to some 50 or 70, but there were some students still failing. At that point, we started a school that was meant for those who failed, but would employ a different uh, approach to education. So I'll share with you the story of this school. And from there, I'll share how education can be made um, sympathetic, compassionate, and sustainable and functional for even the ones that we brand as useless and failures. So I'll take some uh, pictures to help me uh, with that. And we'll go through some uh, images from Ladakh of our work. And along with that, I'll share the story of how the students who were failing everywhere started doing interested th interesting things. Yeah. So uh, I'll try and have for you some images. Uh, let me know if uh, this is working. I'm sharing the screen now, is it? You get my screen? Do you get my uh, images on your monitors? No, Hello? No, no, no? no share screen as of now. Okay, it will come, I think. No, not yet? No. Okay. 
let me it sometimes takes time okay hmm wait just a minute let me hello yes okay um maybe it's not yes please tell me when the share works No? No, no. Share. Oops. Only it works. I'm not sure. Mm. Okay, if it doesn't work in a min uh, half a minute or so, I'll sh picture, I'll paint the pictures with words then, uh, which are not very bad either. <clears throat> no way of. Uh, uh, um. Just if it's okay with you, we can go ahead uh, with the other slides if possible. Yeah, I will. If it doesn't still share. Okay. There's some problem with the screen share, it seems. No? No. Okay. I'm sorry about this uh, image. I thought I'd share some pictures of Ladakh, but anyway. Mm, so, <clears throat> uh, when I saw that uh, students who were generally failing by the 95%, when given the right atmosphere, and uh, as they say, when they don't learn the way you teach, then you start teaching the way they learn. So that's what we started doing uh, with a group of students who were failing uh, still. And to experiment with how education works best for children who cannot uh, cope with just lectures in classrooms with Mm, syllabi or curriculum that uh, doesn't relate to their lives. You can imagine in Ladakh, in the mountains, just getting uh, textbooks from New Delhi or Kashmir uh, didn't make any sense for the children, you know, giving examples of elephants and tigers to children who have never ever seen any such things. It doesn't work. So we started making textbooks for uh, Ladakh so that they can understand it more but textbooks and uh, curriculum was not enough that's when we started building a special school now what our philosophy was that children need to experience hands-on rather than just read about things we human beings i learned uh, through experience that our young ones are more designed and wired to learn from experience rather than from textbooks, written words. And this is true for the millennia that human species has been on this planet. Our ancestors long, long ago, they were not reading about things. They were actually uh, in the field, in the wild as hunter gatherers. They were out in the field doing things and uh, not reading about catching their prey and so on. Simil similarly, as settled farmers, when farming started, they were again, um, you know, uh, out there in action and not sitting listening to lectures. And actually, I believe that nature, nature adapts to the needs of people. And therefore, our human young ones, 
our teenagers are filled with lot of energy to do that to to do learn experientially and uh, when we suddenly stop all experiences and make them sit in classrooms and memorize things this energy that nature packed with them like i was talking about curiosity similarly nature packs teenagers with lot of energy all this energy uh, is uh, held up inside and pent up and that comes out as in ugly forms as teenager rebellion rage and so on when we don't give our children enough opportunities to release that energy in creative constructive ways so therefore at our school we said that the school itself should be designed and built by the students so this was a very special school where the students got together to design what the school should uh, look like and uh, they actually built the school that they designed also moving rocks moving water mud and so on and that took care of all their energy at the same time it gave them the experience of the hands of the you know head hands and heart we call it the three h's of learning which is when education becomes more complete so they would learn about things but that's just a head business but when they do it then when they actually do it with their own hands then it becomes more real so this school um taught them not just how to learn languages and physics and maths but also to apply the same in life and make people's mm-hmm. lives uh, more meaningful and easier so for example while we were designing this school we would use geography to understand how the sun moves in the sky that it is in the southern sky in the winters and therefore in a cold place like ladakh we should have our buildings oriented to the south where the sun stays you know we learn about revolution of the earth around the sun and the axis of uh, the earth but we learn them as a ritual to memorize we don't actually learn the, learn about them as something that we can uh, apply and that's exactly what we did in this school using geography to make the sun fall in such a way on the buildings that they designed and they built that these buildings became finally buildings that could stay warm at plus 20 degrees even in minus 20 ladakhi winters and that was the magic of uh, application based uh, learning that they can live we we have been living in this school in solar heated buildings all these 30 years with not a drop of oil or fossil fuel burned and now some of these students get interested in this application of science and become entrepreneurs who then design such buildings and supply or sort of provide it to society and solve society's problems so today there are many entrepreneurs who learned these things at this school and went out and now provide this solution to people at large to the military to the government and in a cold place like ladakh environmentally speaking it is challenging to keep yourself warm in the winters you you burn oil you burn wood uh, which is very costly at the same time it is costly environmentally also because there is so much emission so much pollution yet the sun that shines above everyone's head with no price you know it's free for all and to master the science of uh, the material that is abun- most abundant right under your feet like mud you can then build with mud natural material and heat with sun a natural energy available abundantly for all rich and poor you know from any part of the world there is nobody so poor they cannot afford the earth under their feet or sun over their head so this is how we learned that education can be an empowering experience which 
helps you live happily in the setting that you are. Now, in most of the hot places, you will need to learn the art and craft of keeping cool in summers. But for Ladakh, it is survival uh, itself in winters. So solving such problems using your education makes it alive, makes it come alive for the children because once they apply and they live in a building themselves, they cannot forget for their lives. And some of these students become so interested in such crafts that they choose it as a career. So many of these students become entrepreneurs like many of you, but in um, fields that people around you need and yet it solves those uh, needs of the people without any harm to environment, which brings us to sustainable solutions or uh, economics, you know, where you have uh, solutions that are not more complicated than the problem itself. Uh, today, in the name of uh, commerce and business, we often come up with the solutions that actually cause more problems than the problem caused. Yeah? So uh, that's what our uh, aim has been. Similarly, uh, not just with uh, the cold of the winter, like you just mentioned, uh, water in a desert environment. Our science and mathematics and other subjects should at least uh, address some of these challenges rather than just uh, being a ritual to get a degree or a certificate uh, of uh, 12th grade or graduation, which doesn't help anybody much except to get a job. And the problem with our education system today is that we tend to give the same recipe, same solution, no matter where you come from, no matter what your challenges are. So whether you come from the high altitude deserts of Ladakh or the coastal Kerala, you get, get to learn the same uh, science and solve the same problems and face the same examinations and go to the same universities. Whether you are from Rajasthan, which is a hot desert or Ladakh, a cold desert or Cherapunji, which is a rainy place, you learn the same things, which doesn't make sense. So we try to experiment and share with people that education needs to be specific to the lives of the people that it should solve the problems and challenges of the people. That's where we need a great um, overhaul in the system because a lot of time and energy is wasted in what we call uh, the process of schooling. You know, people spend a precious quarter of their lives in the name of education and yet they do not much more than a ritual that doesn't really solve anybody's real problems. Just the exercise, the drill, the ritual, and then a certificate, it's not enough. Whereas when you apply, like we did, I wish I could show the pictures. I'll try and show you at some point still. Uh, you find ways of making it very interesting for the children because children are designed and wired to learn by experience. As I said, for millennia, the human species never sat and read and learned or memorized and learned. We always were out in the field doing and learning. And that's what gives that all energy. So when we do that, it makes the subjects unforgettable. You know, rather than cursing our children for forgetting their lessons, I always say, why don't we make the lessons unforgettable? And lessons become unforgettable when you use more than one sense organ, not just reading or listening, but touching and smelling and whole being engaged in that. That's when you really learn and solve problems, gives you the, the, the empathy and the satisfaction of helping others also when you are able to actually apply your education to solve people's problems. So the ice stupas that you mentioned about were one such example. In um, geometry, we learn lots of theories. One of them is that certain shapes have a low surface area and high volume. We just memorize it. Okay, spheres have lowest, vol uh, lowest surface area for the volume. 
and that's where it ends. We may memorize the formula for volume of a sphere and the surface area of a sphere, but we don't go any further. Now, how we got to apply these learnings in Ladakh was when we saw that people Mr. Wanchuk, are you there? I think we've lost him. IT team, can you please check? Now, Moonland may sound very glam. Some connection. Uh, yeah. We have you here now. Okay. Can can you yeah. see me? Yeah. Yes, we can see you and hear you. Okay, sorry about this. If there's some challenge I'm trying to solve. You can. So uh, I was just saying that the only reason people can uh, survive in Ladakh is uh, because of this uh, um, glaciers that we have. Can you by any chance see my screen now? We can absolutely no? see the picture screen. Hmm? Yes, absolutely. No? We can see the pictures now, yes. Okay. So you can see the pictures. Yes. yes. Okay, 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 okay. So uh, let me check if it moves. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is the school where we started um, making experiments for children who had failed, you know, who were rejected by school and the system. Uh, we said, why don't we teach them the way they learn if they don't learn the way we teach. So this was a desert. This was the desert where we went with a batch of uh, some uh, 20 students who had failed and failed. And uh, this desert we wanted to green and make a school, but make a school with the students, with the students themselves. And uh, it was an exercise together with the students to learn their uh, subjects through application to real life. And the first thing we did there was to create an image, um, imagination of what the school will be. So involving the students in imagining what they want. So this actually is from 1994, before anything happened on that desert, the imagination that children had in their minds of was full of um, all the science, all the geography, maths, etc. Et so for example, here you see trees. The trees are not for nothing. They are to break the winds that come from the west. The buildings are facing south. That's because in the northern hemisphere, according to geography, the, uh, the sun stays in the southern hemisphere. So I won't go into details, but I'll share with you the school that it became. So in five years, this uh, barren desert had become a school like this uh, with all solar energy from electricity to heating in minus 20 winters. Everything was from sun alone. Perhaps this was the first solar powered uh, a school campus in the world in 1999 when terms like zero energy or autonomous uh, were not even coined. And this school was built with mud, as I mentioned. And to give, to learn experientially, as I said, the students were to run the school also, not only design and build, but also to run the school. That's when they develop the, the nuances of how to manage things in life. You know, we cannot lecture children into uh, being independent and, uh, you know, be, becoming good managers of their own lives until they actually do it. So the school is run by the students themselves. So they run it like a little country with a little government 
the government is run for two months and every two months they change. They plan for their two months tenure and they execute and they report in the parliament and they get responsibilities which then make them uh, the people they are in future. Responsibilities are real, like taking care of cows, taking care of solar gadgets, taking care of gardening, taking care of power plants, but applying all the theory that you have in your textbooks. Applying, for example, germ theory or microbial theory in making jam out of apricots and thereby prolonging the life of shelf life of apricots from two weeks to two years. Now that's application of the science. That then becomes career for some. Sustainable economies develop from sustainable education when young people who learn it at school fall in love with some of these things and want to make it their career. So there are students who then started a jam and pulp making industry that supplies to many other industries and around the country. Similarly, others who would take care of visitors uh, opened up uh, travel companies, very innovative ones. I won't go into details, but uh, <clears throat> physics, physics. In the chapter of heat, we learn about conduction, convection, radiation, but we just memorize without understanding much. And if you really put them to use, they can make magic happen. So here in the corner, you are seeing how convection, conduction, uh, radiation happens. So the hot air from this greenhouse, as you see on the building, on the building, a transparent sheet, uh, the hot air circulates in the building because the sun heats the greenhouse and the air gets hot and convection in science teaches us that hot air rises. So it rises and goes into the upper floor, gives its heat to the walls, becomes cooler and therefore denser, comes down and is then pushed into the greenhouse again by the flow that is convection. Convection can be of great help in life uh, for people who have to bear minus 20 winters. And together with conduction and radiation that happens at night, people can live happily in such buildings, even if there is no heating at all. Yeah. Um, now, I was talking about uh, mud, soil under our feet. Very natural, non-polluting, non-toxic, but we need to apply our science a little more than our ancestors did, and you can get amazing habitats or houses. So we learn also from our ancestors, from what we see in our surroundings as forts and ruins. So at this school, we said, why only learn from textbooks and teachers? Why not learn from our ancestors from 1000 years ago? So this house, this building that you see, it's a fort in a village that was found to be 1,500 years old. So we said, why not learn from them, how to make buildings that are so long lasting. And that's when we started reverse engineering and seeing what did they do so right? Because not every building lasts this long, uh, not at all the earth buildings. And we would then analyze, as you can see here, lab analyze what went in these buildings and then mix it or blend it with the science with, that you teach in classrooms. And then the students start doing it themselves, what our ancestors did so well uh, over a thousand years ago. And we lost the art and craft thanks to all these Western uh, concepts of buildings and materials like cement, concrete, which are a disaster in a cold place like Ladakh, so far away, so polluting, so hard to transport. And yet this material that our ancestors used can be rediscovered using the science uh, that we do. And then some of these students fall in love with this and become professionals uh, who make it a entrepreneurship, a startup in earth buildings. Anybody can make a phone call and you get a design for a passive solar heated, fully solar heated, zero carbon emission, zero pollution uh, building like this. This one uh, you know, is made for clients and does not need any heating at all. 
um, and inside they need not be very unpleasant either just because they are built of earth which is an ancient material uh, it can be very beautiful and tasteful also so this kind of uh, education and the entrepreneurship or enterprise that it leads to among the students can actually solve problem like this this is in this image if you can see you can see the city of lay town of lay on a winter evening i'm sorry there's some uh, something drawing on its own getting creative uh, with that red line that's not supposed to be so you can see the city all covered in smoke do you see that that's thanks to burning fossil fuels and wood and so on to cope up with the cold winters this is what people are doing uh, when they just imitate something from delhi and build in ladakh they are not suitable for the uh, place here for coal place and then they have to burn five times more fuels to keep it warm and then make the city into a total mess like delhi becomes nowadays in winter so becomes leh because of these heating uh, reasons in ladakh and a house like this has no emission whatsoever a marvel of science and education in a way um yeah so when you when you do something different people laugh at you when we started in 94 to build with earth people used to laugh at us for going backwards but i've always believed that uh, if you if you are sure about where you are going then you should persevere and take whatever they say because the last laugh is going to be yours so the world started catching up over the decade because environmental issues became so big in the world that by 2016 for the same buildings we were given the world terra award in lyon france yeah, same things that used to laugh at us for going backwards by this time the world started realizing and uh, acknowledging our efforts so i always say people may laugh but if you know where you are going then they stand aside to let you go but if you are yourself doubtful not sure then of course people laugh you give up and uh, not changes similarly for the energy systems that we started working with the, our students at this school like cooking happens with solar energy at this school all the cooking here happens with solar energy just sun no no fire just sun similarly greenhouses give you fresh vegetables even in minus 20 winters lighting is all natural electricity is from sun um, water lifting is from sun even the cows on the right you can see live in solar heated cow sheds yeah? warm cow sheds and for these also people wouldn't understand when we were starting with them applying school education to real life and people would say why do you go through this why don't you just teach for exam but slowly people catch up and by 2017 we were given the global award for sustainable architecture so what i am trying to bring home is that if you know where you are going then world catches up with you similarly the uh, the the thing about water solutions i i told you how we learn in geometry about these shapes and the surface area and volume but it comes handy here in ladakh to solve the water problem something called ice stupa that you were told about is a grave has become a need in ladakh this is a typical ladakhi valley can you see the picture yeah yeah this is a typical ladakhi village or a valley you can see the image i hope Yes, yes, we are able to. Yeah. Yes, I'm. This is my last example of how uh, education done with a difference can help young people find their career and solve many people's problem and make the uh, world more sustainable. Yeah. So Ladakhi people do not have many, um, you know, gadgets and assets like pumps and facilities like that. But we often miss what we do have so in this village you can see all the farms barren this is early spring 
all the farms need water and there is only a trickle in the stream. Uh, at the time when people need water, there is not much water. And yet what we do have is a slope. You can see that there is an upslope and there is a downslope using nothing, no machines, no assets, no you know, uh, gadgets, except just gravity of this upslope and downslope, you can create uh, water or freeze water in the shapes that I mentioned, shapes that have high volume, but low surface area. Now, why I'm talking about surface area is because any snow and ice in winter melts uh, in early spring itself. So there's nothing left till May when farmers need water, you know, all the snow and ice is gone. So we said, why not make it in the geometry that we learn in class has low surface area. For example, uh, not a sphere, it would be difficult, but if you just use the gravity by putting a pipe upstream and bring it downstream, yeah, High school science says that water will always maintain its level. Very simple pipe, put upstream one end and the other end on a desert and you let water flow. There is pressure in the pipe because high school science, water maintains its level. So there is pressure developing. You put a fountain and the water is squirted or splashed into the air that is minus 20. At this temperature, the water loses its heat and freezes immediately into shapes like these. Not quite spheres or hemisphere, but cones, which have low surface area for the volume. Now, low surface area means that the sun cannot melt it. When the sun does not get surface area to melt, the ice does not melt for a long time. So the winter water which nobody needs in winter because there is no farming in Ladakhi winters. We would freeze in these shapes. This one, you can see this uh, cone of ice uh, holds about 3 million liters of water, 30 lakh liters of water. But thanks to middle school geometry, this ice melts only in May. It is made in January, February, when there is water, but no use of water, we freeze it and store it in these shapes, which have low surface area. Therefore, sun cannot melt like other ice and snow. And therefore, it is available to the farmer uh, to grow things. I will not go into details, but here you can see these 5,000 trees were grown thanks to that ice stupa cone, which melts in April and May only, yeah? which uses the water when it is abundant, but gives its water back upon melting in May when there is no water for a desert like this. And 5,000 trees were planted by villagers on this desert, which has never seen greenery ever. Now this has become something of a movement uh, huge ice stupas. This one is said to be half the height of the Qutub Minar yeah? and holds about 70 lakh liters of water. And slowly it's becoming a movement in many, many villages, including Switzerland. Now Austria is also doing, Pakistan is doing. So uh, likewise, it spreads and uh, provides solutions to people's everyday need. So this is how education can be applied. And, um, you know, it gives solutions to people and it gives careers to our children. Mm, I not go into too much, but because you are all entrepreneurs, there are entrepreneurs who come up, you know, village youth who start uh, uh, financing their ice stupas by running ice cafes inside the ice stupas, if you see there. So some young, uh, innovative people started uh, cafes inside the ice stupas. Others started ice climbing, which is an adventure sport, um, quite a fad in the West these days. So you climb uh, your own peaks in a way. 
And this uh, innovation also, uh, as I said, if you continue on the path, no matter what and all the laughter and so on, despite the laughter, uh, world starts catching up. So this uh, one got us the Rolex award for entrepreneurship. And now we are applying all such things to start a university. This was a outcome of a school, an alternative school. Now we are working on an alternative university. So the idea is that we apply our education, whether school or university, to solve problems and not just, uh, you know, uh, make people into consumers of products and uh, some income from that. But we should also be contributing to the people and their challenges that they face and uh, definitely not add more problems than they already have. Let's try solving if you can, but if not, don't add problems is what we try to have uh, the spirit that we uh, try our um, that our students uh, you know carry forward in their lives so i'll uh, stop with the images around here um, because this uh, but is a big but uh, you know uh, all these ice stupas are fine all these uh, solar heated buildings are fine but we need to all learn whether in school or in life something bigger otherwise these small things cannot solve our problems and that that's something in the end i wanted to share with all of the people around the world as part of our continuing education beyond schools and universities is to learn to live simply yeah? and therefore this last uh, new year we started a movement called the i live simply movement yeah? i live simply is a movement to spread the awareness among the people that we cannot be happy only by amassing material goods. You can amass any amount of material goods and trash the planet, but it's never ending. You may have a small car, then you want a bigger car, and you want an even bigger car, and yet you're not happy because there's always a bigger and better thing that your neighbor has. So until you learn to be happy, to be contented, you will trash the world and uh, wreck yourself and there'll be no happiness. So that's why we take inspiration from uh, Mahatma Gandhi saying that live simply so that others may simply live. Yeah? We want to learn to live simply so that the rest of the world simply lives. Or like Buddha said that for a human being, and I want to say this to entrepreneurs also, for an entrepreneur, it's a greater achievement to conquer a single desire than to fulfill 1000 desires. Right now, our planet is uh, dictated by this Western concept of just fulfilling desires, fulfilling desire after desire after desire, with goods after goods after goods, and it's never ending. And in the process, our lakes are filled with trash, our ocean and the life there is gone, and we are even not happy. So how about instead of trying to fulfill 1000 desires, we try to root out a desire and another and be happy with the minimal things that we could. And that might be the answer for the world to sustain so that we all do our businesses and yet not kill the very, you know, uh, planet that we are uh, supposed to live on. And therefore, uh, a sustainable planet by living simply could be an answer. And in this field, India has always led the world and should once again lead the world not in fulfilling desires alone but in conquering desires and overcoming desires to become happy with less of uh, material goods i'll stop here to take questions otherwise it will go on and on and uh, on so it will be much more interactive if you yeah thank you questions. so much thank you so much mr wangshu for sharing yeah.
such enriching experiences and enlightening enlightening with us all valuable information we have a lot of questions coming in um if you permit we'll take some so let's begin with ms janabi fukan our flo national president to take the first question mm -hmm. i would uh, actually like to give the opportunity to my fellow members and get back to mr sonam in the end let the others have a chance to question him right. as well so uh, can we have saloni mehta our governing board member please um mr vanchu can you please um, uh, stop your screen share for now okay 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 sure sure yes yes perfect um saloni mehta can we have you please you know okay uh namaskar mr vanchu it's so nice namaskar. to hear you it's so nice to hear you i have to tell you that i also belong to your earthwise state i belong to jammu okay okay nice. so my question to you is sir nowadays the children are exposed to so much digital world so you do you think that uh, the present uh, education system can cope up with their learning and knowledge um yeah it can be incorporated if it is if it hijacks us or our children uh into all that it has uh, all the temptations then yes it can be a very negative thing but if it is used as part of education i think it can be an amazing improvement over the past you know in the past our schools and classrooms have been uh, about one teacher uh, lecturing in front and the teacher may not be the best teacher around in your town or in the world but with digital medium if put to right use you can have the best people in the world on the subject talk to you directly which can be much better than a teacher uh, a mediocre teacher standing in front of your class and uh, lecturing on something that he may not even be clear himself which happens a lot in many schools so i think that in future uh, the first conceptual clarity will perhaps come from digital online resources resources mm -hmm. schools may become the place where the children go to clarify things to share with other young people to apply on projects like i told you about our school so yeah. schools will not be the place where you lecture and talk up, tell about things they will become places where you experiment and explore and digital medium can be an amazing initiator of the discussion and the learning process but if you give a free license and uh, just hand you over your children to the uh, the digital world then it can be more dangerous than anything i think thank you so much sir. you made it so clear thank you thank you uh, can you have another gv member of our sangeeta lalwani please good evening everyone good evening mr wangchuk mr wangchuk i have two qu i have two questions for you what is the maximum age that a student can apply in your university would you take an application from a middle aged woman <laughs> <laughs> oh any any age is young if you have curiosity alive <laughs> thank you sir uh, thank so you it's, sir it's uh, you you can be old as uh, a dying old at 10 if your curiosity is dead and you can be as young as you can want to be if your curiosity is <laughs> so alive. i am sending in an application sir thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> the university doesn't make any distinction about age Yes. so another question i have for you we've been speaking about a lot about uh, we should have ab abandoned chinese goods or ban chinese goods mm -hmm. but in india we have received more than 3500 us million dollars in our startups like flipkart and zomato and swiggy what should we do about that sir so i generally say that take have time on your side don't do things don't think that you have to do everything in 24 hours yeah that's yes. when people start burning and breaking things which i don't think is the right use of the energy or uh, or the thought so have time on your side that's why i say 
uh, software you can uninstall in one week. Hardware like finished goods, one year. Hardware with mixed, you know, raw materials, parts, and okay. so on, two years. Yes. And products that involve investments, you know, yes. in yes. three years. In oh, okay. three years. So okay. you give the companies time to adjust and adapt. They can't yes. change in two days or two months, but yes. they can adjust and adapt in three years. If they don't, people will express their choice for Indian invested or friendly invested companies over yes. these ones, and they'll go yes. out of business if things go well. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have Meenal Jain with us, please. Meenal, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, hi. Good evening, Mr. Vanchuk. It was such a pleasure Hi. to hear you. Hi. And uh, I'm an architect by profession, and it's. Hello. Hello. There's a break. Meena, please unmute yourself. You have muted yourself. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes. Can yes, hear you now? Please go ahead. Hi, Meena. Yeah, hi, uh, hi, Mr. Vanchuk. And yes. it was great hearing you. I'm myself an architect by profession, and you seem to be a better architect too. With all the beautiful designs you created in these school buildings and all, so I have two questions to you, for for you. One is that in today's time, and how do you instill a sense of focus and achievement in today's generation, and invoke a part of patriotism or loyalty in them? And since you already uh, one more question to, uh, following with this, since you already reinvented the system in Ladakh, how about the I'm not able to hear that. Hello. Please unmute yourself. I hello. We can hear you now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Should I repeat the questions? The second question. Okay. Uh, the no, first first question of I got it. Yes. Shall I answer that? Yeah. 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 Then I'll ask the second question. Yes. Yes. So uh, the focus um, part. Uh, we become out of focus and you know restless and short attention spans and things when we are bombarded with these uh, flittering uh, you know digital devices from early age so i think that's a very bad thing for a child's mind i would keep children away from uh, you know mass social media at young age and engage them more in things to do with their hands and fingers and so on play with clay play with mud play with stones go out in nature wood play with wood and real materials of the world and applications that are based on um, real real things natural materials and then expose them to these uh, digital things much later when you give them in as as projects to manage they tend to return, uh, retain more focus because more sense organs of their being are engaged in a project than in a textbook or in a website so i always encourage that we make the uh, the foundation of our children with real natural materials and processes and only at later ages uh, expose them to these things that make it very difficult for them to focus on anything in life they need to gain their satisfaction also mm -hmm. not the children itself the today's uh, younger generation too mm -hmm. yes and but the same same work has to be has to go into these uh, real uh, three dimensional things also there's so much gone in digital but not enough uh, uh, you know fun and curiosity into uh, more natural stuff we, perhaps that will happen as people learn that this is not the best thing we are doing to our children but uh, it, there's much more needed in that field. Yeah. Uh, one more follow up with this question since you already revived the education system in Ladakh how much time for pan india oh i don't <laughs> consider i don't consider it uh, me to be doing everywhere it's a story of somebody from the place who knows the place finding solutions so i only look forward to sharing our uh, experience and our mistakes with people like you who may want to do it for your own area true thank you so much okay so we have another question from a member 
um what prompted you to call for a complete boycott of chinese products give up all chinese software in a week and chinese hardware in a year and how has been the response of the same okay the prompting thing was mainly this aggression on our border number 1 but aggressions have happened in the past also what was different this time was the aggression was not just military uh, i could connect the dots and see that they are doing this to vietnam they are doing this to taiwan and the us navy in the south china sea so it is more political inside china and caused by economic uh, disturbances post covid so therefore our response should be economic and that can be best done by citizens and therefore i called and said the military can will do their <coughs> responding but citizens in this case have a great responsibility to respond uh, by boycotting chinese goods so that was the reason and what was the second question uh, how is in the response well the response has been overwhelming and, and a bit too intense i am scared when people throw away their televisions and burn their gadgets that's not what i'm looking for i'm not looking for you know emotional outbursts i'm looking for very cool headed strategic long lasting uh, choice of uh, you know what you want to use your wallet on so you have to do it over 2 to 3 years rather than just in one day and it doesn't need to be a, a you know strict thing as long as um, it 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 sends a message to china you don't have to hurt india so if there is a company that uses some raw material for say a medicine which will hurt indian patients then continue but have time on your side in 3 years you can be independent of it so take time and keep it uh, for long term not just uh, short term emotional outbursts yeah so we have another one do you think that most indian educational institutions systematically kill creativity in students and what is your stand point on the concept of homeschooling hmm so quite unfortunately that is what has become you know schools have become like a factory of a centralized design whereas places are so different their needs are so different then children are so different so there is nothing tailor made there is nothing individually adapted it's all one size fits all one solution for like i said from uh, rajasthan the hot desert to ladakh the cold desert to coastal kerala to cherapunji it's all the same so therefore it does kill creativity because it's not applied to solving uh, challenges it's just a ritual and therefore it needs to be much more um, decentralized i believe in decentralizing education to adapt to each not only region not only state but village to village it should be different with the same theme and spirit but very different application now homeschooling is uh, wonderful as long as you can afford it not every child can afford it their parents may not be able to do it so where one can afford wonderful but i don't agree with people who say all schooling should be home schooling that will be very difficult for most people whoever can afford and have the energy and the passion wonderful but if you don't then there should be community schools for everybody you know your parents may not be able to do that home schooling so it may be better to have professionals do it yeah so uh, based on how the situation is absolutely true thank you and we would have a last question from our uh, national floor president ms janabi now it's been absolutely uh, you know so insightful there's so much of learning from you that going back to nature living simply sustainability that is the need for our planet but in the middle of all this with covid and the new threat that you have in your northern borders and i'm from the northeast of the eastern flanks 
and the grieving that we are doing for our soldiers. What do you have to say about the current situation, Mr. Langchuk? Well, I think it is uh, grave and uh, sad, yet it is a great opportunity also, an opportunity to set the world right, you know, because we are dealing, okay, with Corona and it teaches us how our actions earlier was harming the planet, how we had made the skies so murky, how we had made the rivers so dirty, and suddenly when we stop that, we can see the results. So it's a great opportunity to learn and to understand that we need to live simpler lives. You know? We can't just go on chasing after things and our mother earth is dead and you know, we are left with orphans with lots of material yeah. goods. Uh, doesn't make sense. So we learn that from the COVID situation, from the Chinese aggression, we learn that we should not be dependent on a country like this. And out of all sympathy, out of all sympathy and empathy for the people in China, we should do everything so that this regime does not become even more powerful and um, victimize its own people and uh, control the rest of the world. So we need to act. And there is a way we can. There's something we can do. In the past, we didn't have anything in our hands. Citizens couldn't go with guns to the border. But today, in this case, you have your wallets. You are wallet commandos. Yeah. So you can do something. That's what we see as an opportunity. And economically, it's an amazing opportunity for entrepreneurs and uh, you know industrialists to fill the vacuum. Suddenly we are saying those things are not good and not good to support that regime. The whole country is ready to buy Indian. What more opportunity do you want? It's coming on a platter. Rise to the occasion and fill the vacuum. So it's a great opportunity for entrepreneurs in India to come up with solutions that uh, does away with those. At the same time, I feel that uh, we should not be replacing thing for thing. So China used to make this, we'll make this. You know, we used to buy 10 pairs of cheap Chinese shoes. Now we'll buy 10 pairs of cheap Indian shoes. No, we need to learn to live simply also. We need to learn that we don't need 10 pairs of shoes. We can do with three pairs of well-made, well-crafted, handcrafted pairs of shoes, which helps our uh, artisans and gives us satisfaction. So we learn to yeah. use our money for the good of people and planet rather than a regime that, uh, you know, doesn't have good intentions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. This tells us more and more what our prime minister has been trying to tell us. We have to be more vocal about local and look at Atmanirbhar Bharat. And you are really showing us the way. Thank you so much. Priya. Thank you so much, Mr. Wanchu, for answering all our questions. And now I would like to call our senior vice chair, Meetu Kohli, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, Ria. And thank you, Mr. Wanchu. If you are going to allow all middle aged women to uh, be there, I think we might have a small flow chapter very soon in Ladakh. No, Many of us are them. eager to join. <laughs> okay. So as George Bernard Shaw quoted, you see things and you say why, but I dream about things that never were. And I say, why not? Your dreams are the only valid unless you work hard to make them true. And Mr. Wangchu, you have motivated many to prove the same. Words are just not enough to express our deep gratitude and admiration to Mr. Wangchuk for his presence here today. With your simplicity, your humility, and your revolutionary approach, you've become a role model, not only for many young students, but even for parents in apprising us that effective learning can also be beyond books and curriculums. Thanks to you, our youngsters have imbibed to value their dreams and passionately follow them. Your presence here today will definitely be itched in our memories forever. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, sir. And on behalf of our entire Flow family in Dor, I also wish to extend a heartfelt thanks to Jahanabi for gracing our event today. Jahanabi, it was so kind of you to come here from, with your busy schedule and be amongst us. We are completely honored. And we are keen on learning a lot from you during this entire Flow journey. Thank you so very much. And now, the time to thank the Backbones, our sponsors for the year, the creative and the digital partners I missed. A special mention to the beautiful curated videos we just saw. Our patron sponsors, DP Jewelers, I missed. Taskers, Raj Suzuki and Weather Homes. Our travel partners, Overseas Tours. Our radio partners, 94.3 MyFM. Thanks to the media. And a special thanks to all our audience here today for being with us. Have a great week ahead. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.